All right, so welcome everyone to tonight's presentation, Clinical Aspects of Lewy Body Dementia and Parkinson's Disease Dementia by Dr. Mary Jenkins. And we're very excited to have Dr. Jenkins join us tonight. Um, before we get started, uh, just a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, you'll notice that your camera is off and you are muted, and we ask that everyone remain that way throughout the presentation. We are going to have an opportunity for you to ask questions. So throughout the presentation, as the questions occur to you, if you want to write them into the Q&A section. So if you move your mouse or touch the screen, there'll be a Q&A tab um, on my computer. It's at the bottom of the screen. So if you click on that, you can type your questions in there. And um, there'll be a couple of times throughout the presentation that Dr. Jenkins will take questions. And then at the end, we will definitely have um, more time then for questions and answers. All right, so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mary Jenkins. Dr. Jenkins is a movement disorders neurologist and associate professor at the University of Western Ontario. Dr. Jenkins started out her working life as a physical therapist, working with individuals with Parkinson's disease. She then returned to school to com complete her MD and neurology residency at the University of Western Ontario. Following residency, Dr. Jenkins completed two years of fellowship training in movement disorders. Dr. Jenkins works as a neurologist at the London Health Science Center. Her research interests include motor, motor control and Parkinson's disease. So welcome, Dr. Jenkins. Thank you. Welcome everyone out there. I We were saying it's always strange when we can't see people, um, but um, welcome to, to all of you. Um, thank you for inviting me to give this talk. Um, I'm going to review some aspect of the Lewy body diseases. Um, I will try to pause to answer any questions that you have. Um, there's a lot of terminology and I'll, I'll, I'll try to address that and address some of the um, different aspects of Lewy body, Parkinson's, what they are, how they're the same, how they aren't the same. So, so a dementia is an impairment in brain function, as you know, and it um, can affect memory, but also thinking, um, language, as in coming up with words, um, judgment, um, and behavior. We know that overall, 7% um, of people over the age of 65 can develop a dementia even without Parkinson's and as people get older that increases with increasing age. Um, one of the terms there's this Lewy body dementia and it is um, the term that is used to refer to both dementia with Lewy body and Parkinson's disease dementia so which it's, it's the catch-all phrase. I'm going to talk about each of these entities separately um, because there is some research that they may not be quite the same thing, although they often have um, quite similar clinical presentations and often um, similar treatments, but there are some subtle changes uh, between the two of them. So if we look at the causes of why someone may have cognitive impairment, Alzheimer's is still the most common cause. Vascular or stroke-related uh, dementia being the second most common cause. And then dementia with Lewy bodies is the third most common cause. And we think of it affecting about 4 to 8% of dementia. And then Parkinson's disease to dementia on its on its own is um, less common. Um, and so I thought what I would do is I would take you through a couple of cases to illustrate things. Obviously, I've changed the names, although the stories are, are true to the people. And so the first gentleman actually was a um, high school teacher. Um, so I have him at the front of the class uh, teaching here. Um, so he's a 75 year old retired high school teacher. His daughter brings him into the clinic. Um, and he's telling me that over the previous 
six months, he's been seeing things that other people aren't see. Um, and these are very vivid images. So they're children and they're playing a circle game and he can tell me what they're wearing. He can tell me what kind of activities they're doing. He's, he's actually quite interested in them. He's aware of them. Um, he thinks that they aren't real. Sometimes he thinks they are and sometimes not, but he isn't bothered by them. And they're all children. They're, they're, there aren't any, any adults in the group. Um, at the same time, he can become quite, um, he can become quite confused easily. So He's um, getting lost sometimes if he's going out for a walk, has trouble finding his way back home. Um, he also has these big fluctuations that some days he's very clear and other days he's really quite confused. And a lot of people will talk about that as being quite typical of, of any of the Louis body um, diseases. And he's also slowed down. So he also has physical symptoms. He has um, a little bit of trouble with walking, trouble rolling over in bed, slower when he's getting dressed in the morning. So he presents to his doctor to um, uh, figure out what is going on with him. Um, and, uh, and so what I wanted to just talk about again, so this is a case of someone who has a dementia with Lewy body. So we talked about there's the dementia with Lewy body or the Parkinson's disease dementia and that they're two separate entities somewhat. Um, the dementia with Lewy bodies presents at a similar age to Alzheimer's. So average age is probably around 65 to 70. We don't know what the underlying cause is. We um, do think that like Parkinson's, there's some kind of an environmental risk factor. And so pesticides are a, are a common knowing risk factor for Parkinson's. And we think that it may also be associated with the Lewy bodies. We think people may be predisposed to developing these and the environmental risk brings them out. There are uh, very rare, a few causes of a single gene related um, dementia with Lewy bodies, um, uh, but uncommon. Most of these don't run in families and um, they may occur um, more commonly in, in some families. Again, that may be because of a common environmental risk or in a common exposure. Overall, though, we feel that the risk is low um, uh, for it to involve other family members. The core Features are this uh, progressive cognitive decline that impacts on every, everyone's day-to-day -day function. So you have to have both of those, not just the cognitive loss, but actually difficulty carrying out your day-to-day activities. Memory impairment tends to occur later. So often people have a reasonable memory, but they can't do um, uh, judgment tasks or calculations or figuring out how to do things like use a remote or work the microwave. Um, and they often have impairment of what we term frontal lobe functions, such as paying attention, um, executive functioning, which can be doing two tasks at the same time. Verbal fluency is how easy it is for them to come up with words. They have difficulty doing two tasks at a time. And then this visual spatial um, ability. So trouble with getting, um, getting lost outside. Um, if they're out driving, trying to figure out how to come back to their home. They um, very characteristic we have quite a fluctuation that people can 
appear like they have no problems or can appear very, very confused. And it tends to fluctuate, not really moment to moment, more day to day, that some days are good and some days um, people are more impaired. And on the days when they're more impaired, it's particularly to do with tension. They also might be drowsier. As I said with our gentleman, the lucid nations are very well formed. They're often recurrent. So as, as the gentleman I saw was, they're often about the same thing. And when they first start out, they aren't bothersome or frightening. They can progress, as, as you probably know, over time to become more bothersome, but at the start tend to be typically not bothersome and frightening. 75% of people that have a dementia with Lewy bodies will go on to develop Parkinsonism. Um, and um, that usually um, occurs, the, the cognitive issues have to occur in the first year that people get Parkinsonism. So they can have the cognitive impairment for longer, but the Parkinsonian symptoms um, have to occur either following or, or altogether in the first year of the symptom. So the um, the Parkinson's and the cognitive impairment are, are all part of the same early prison. And then um, uh, very commonly, people will act out dreams in their sleep. And the dreams are, are quite interesting because they're very stereotyped from person to person. So it's, the, it's often an animal or a person chasing them or they're fighting with bad guys. And it's their frightening dreams. And they can become quite violent to the bed partner. Um, they can hit out at them. Um, the patients typically don't recall the dream unless you wake them up in the middle of the dream. So if you're talking to them the following day, they often have no recall of the dream. They don't remember hitting out at their partner or acting out dreams. Um, but if you wake them up in the middle of the dream, then they can tell you what's happening. But if they sleep through it by the following day, they have no recall of uh, having had the dream. And then we talk about this response to neuroleptics and what they're talking about is um, sort of older drugs like, like Haldol, which is often used in people who hallucinate, can make the Parkinson's worse. So um, Haldol can cause you to become stiff and slow. And so um, that uh, we we avoid those. There, there are other neuroleptic medications that I'll uh, talk about in a bit, but quetiapine or, or um, clozapine, which are which do not worsen Parkinsonism. And um, so they often have uh, low blood pressure with standing up, so fainting spells. They often have bladder issues, um, frequent falls. They can hear things, and they can go on to develop a delusion or or an or an idea and the delusion this is as the disease progresses maybe that um someone in the family is trying to take their money or if they own property that they're trying to take the property out from under them or that their spouse may be having a having an affair with someone that they have this really fixed idea around that. And then mood issues are very, very um, common. In terms of the actual Parkinsonism, it isn't quite like typical Parkinson's in that usually both sides of the body are affected at the same time. In Parkinson's, usually it'll start on one side than the other. Tremor is much less common than it is in, in um, idiopathic Parkinson's, um, but the rest of it kind of fits with how Parkinson's look. So a couple of, um, a couple of different patterns from that. Um, okay. And, uh, and I think that's kind of a, I see someone has a question in the chat. 
And that's not a bad place just to pause for a minute if somebody wanted to ask a question. So this question that we have right now um, in reference to REM sleep disorder, is this, oh, yeah. is uh -huh. this more prevalent in Lewy body or Parkinson's dementia? Um, yeah, so actually it, it occurs in both. Um, I think uh, hmm, that's a good question. Um, it is, it probably occurs more common in the dementia with Lewy bodies because it is felt now to be a criteria. So it's one of the things that they look for. If you, if you have that, then it's more convincing. Although certainly in, in Parkinson's, we can see it in a number of people, but probably a little bit more common in the dementia with Lewy bodies. Okay. Any, any other, oh, another question popping up? Uh, this question is, does REM sleep disorder improve as dementia with Lewy body advances? So as the disease progressive progresses, do you see less of the REM sleep disorder symptoms? Yeah, uh, not typically, although some of the medications we use help it. So we may see an improvement even without treating it. The medication that we use to treat the movement, the Parkinsonism, can make the, the REM sleep behavior better, but it doesn't typically tend to get better on its own. Oh. Okay, so here's a question. How do you determine whether the dementia is Alzheimer's, Lewy body, or Parkinson's? Yeah, so that's uh, such a good question. Um, uh, so um, Alzheimer's versus Lewy body, and I'm, I'm going to use Lewy body as the term of both the dementia with Lewy body and the Parkinson's related um, dementia. Um, in both of those, it tends to be more, as I said, um, like executive dysfunction, trouble with planning, trouble with getting lost, um, having hallucinations, having these fluctuations. Um, whereas with, with Alzheimer's, memory is more of the early presenting symptom. People with Alzheimer's don't tend to fluctuate. They also don't have hallucinations, which is a very very key um, uh, property of the Lewy body. And so um, just one thing that I'll kind of address, because I, I think, as I said, the terms be, become difficult. I actually had a picture of a Lewy body and I took it down and I maybe should have left it up. Lewy bodies are these bluish um, colored abnormal proteins that occur in brain cells in people that have Parkinson's or dementia with Lewy bodies. If the if the Lewy bodies occur in the brain stem, people have more motor symptoms. If they occur more in the frontal part of the brain, then it causes more of the cognitive issues. So um, both diseases have these abnormal proteins that are called Lewy bodies in the brain cells. There's one more question here, okay. and then maybe we'll move on to the presentation. I'm not, you may answer or offer some suggestions for, for this throughout the presentation, but it has to do with handling balance issues and the person tends to fall quite easily. Um, yeah, um, I ha haven't talked a lot about that, to be honest, but I'll, I'll I, I, I have something maybe coming up that I'll address with that. So if I don't answer that, just ask me again. But I do talk a bit about treatment towards um, the end. Sounds good. Um, I made a note was, of it. And um, just sorry to interrupt. Um, folks are raising their hand. If you have a question, please type it into the chat. That's the way that we're able to... Um, to uh, ask the questions of Dr. Jenkins. So, so um, uh, this is just a very brief overview about Parkinson's. So Parkinson's is slowness of movement, tremor, stiffness, and balance issues. Symptoms um, almost universally begin on one side more than the other, and one side is always more affected than the other. Unlike what we think of as typical Dementia with Lewy bodies, they tend to start on the same side at the same time. Uh, 
dementia and hallucinations are not an early feature of Parkinson's. So if we see someone that has Parkinson's and they're also having the dementia and hallucinations, then we're thinking this is dementia with Lewy bodies. And dementia with Lewy bodies has both the cognitive issue and the motor symptoms. However, in Parkinson's, people do have very mild executive dysfunction. So someone who has Parkinson's and is working often has difficulty coping with that because at work often we're dual tasking. We're on the phone, we're typing on a computer, someone's coming in your office to ask you a question. Um, you're having to coordinate multiple things at the same time. And in early Parkinson's, all, although people can function quite well and can do um, many tasks quite well. They have difficulties doing multiple things at this same time. Um, and so I'm just going to go on and uh, talk about, um, this is a very lovely woman that I followed for a lot of years um, that had Parkinson's. Um, she and her husband were square dancers. I don't know if this is quite a square dancing picture, but it was the only one I could find on the internet. So, um, Mrs. White is um, 79. She's living with her husband. She's had Parkinson's for 12 years. And very typical Parkinson's started with tremor and slowness in the right hand. Gradually, she had some involvement in the left, had some mood issues. Um, she and her husband were very active. They like square dancing, golfing. They traveled to uh, Florida every winter. Um, and then, and now we're talking 12 years into the Parkinson's, she starts to have memory problems. So she was a big cook and she said that she couldn't follow a recipe. Um, she was forgetting that, you know, people were coming over to visit. At night, she would get up and sometimes wander in the house, having very vivid dreams and started seeing people who weren't there. And she would see a little girl and she would tell me that she was wearing a yellow dress and um, she was not at all scared about seeing her. She was often worried about her though. Like, where is the little girl gone and what is she doing? So comes to see me and, um, you know, going through all of our tests, we diagnose her with Parkinson's disease dementia. And so I just want to talk about that. So as we said, this occurs in someone who already has a diagnosis of Parkinson's and typically occurs later on in the disease. So we talk about the idea that a third of people with Parkinson's may develop a dementia after 10 years. We don't typically think of it as starting early. The risks tend to be um, people who are older, if there's lots of mood issues, if their Parkinson's is worse, and if they've had side effects of medication that have caused some thing psychosis. And um, as I said, early in Parkinson's, people can have some mild memory problems. The causes, and I think someone had asked me, so how do you tell them apart? And clinically, we can tell them apart a little bit. Um, but there was a very um, famous study. So a group of nuns, and I believe they were in the U.S., um, when they died as an as an order, they all decided they would give their their brains to science for evaluation. And so from that, they were able to look at a very large sample of people, many of whom had a dementia and had been diagnosed with various causes. When they looked at everyone overall, a third of them had the pure Parkinson's or the pure Lewy body. So these abnormal proteins that are made up of, you've probably heard alpha nuclein is the name of the protein in the Lewy body. So they only had Lewy bodies that were, as I said, in the, in the frontal part of the brain where our judgment and thinking and processing is. A third of them had uh, stroke related causes, and a third of them had Alzheimer's. So Alzheimer's uh, pathology has a different type of protein. It's it's called a tau protein. They all, also have these things that you've probably heard of called amyloid plaques and then neurofibrillation. 
very tangles. And um, and so we we know that um, in Parkinson's, people can have one of these or a mix of these. And so a third of people that have a dementia with Parkinson's, it's actually Alzheimer's. So it happens that at that at the same time, unfortunately, they develop the two diseases separately, or they've also had strokes that have added um, added to their dementia. So it's not always just because someone has Parkinson's doesn't mean that it's the Lewy bodies causing the cognitive issues. Um, and I, I'm going on to treatment. I don't know if anyone had any questions just about that part about the difference between the Parkinson's and the Lewy body. I don't see any, I don't see any chat. Okay, I, well, I'll, I'll carry on because I can, I can answer back to things. So what we do know is that for both diseases, and it doesn't matter if it starts out as Parkinson's and then 10 years later has a dementia, or it starts out with the dementia and the Parkinsonism at the same time, the treatment for the dementia is still these class of medications called cholinesterase inhibitors. And they're very effective for both causes of the dementia. And the two um, drugs that have been studied the most are the dinepazil, Aricept, or rivastigmine. Exelon. And as you may know, Exelon comes in a in a patch or a pill, and the nephesol aricept only comes in a pill. The interesting thing is, although these were developed to treat Alzheimer's, they actually work better in Parkinson's than they do in, in Alzheimer's. And the other thing that is important is that treating their mood treating their Parkinson's and treating their sleep issues may also improve their overall function. So um, to be aware that, you know, sometimes we're dealing with a few issues at this same time. Um, and uh, so for treating the Parkinsonism in anyone that has any cognitive issues, we tend to stick to the levodopa carbidopa. The other medications we have available for Parkinsonism can actually worsen cognitive issues. Louis, um, levodopa um, can as well. And so we want to be sure that we don't over treat people. And in some cases, we have to really limit the levodopa because it can worsen the symptoms. Treating the REM sleep behavior disorder, um, as, I, as I had alluded to earlier, um, treating with the Parkinson's medication sometimes can help that. But then other medications that have been studied are melatonin, which is an over the counter product and clonazepine. The, um, uh, the hallucinations, um, if they don't respond to the cholinesterase inhibitors, which often they do, then there are other medications we can use. Quetiapine and clozapine are generally the safest. In the US, there is this newer drug that um, we don't have here yet in Canada. Um, Dr. Jenkins, I'm not sure yes. if we can uh, yes. look Go at ahead. the question. Uh, how do you treat REM sleep issues in one with dementia? Wouldn't sleep aids be dangerous? Oh, interesting. Yeah, so I, you know, I know, first of all, melatonin is not dangerous at, at all with someone with a dementia. So we aren't worried about melatonin. Clonazepam we use very cautiously, right? Because clonazepam can worsen cognitive issues. Although if the REM sleep behavior disorder is causing the person to harm themselves or harm somebody else, or is interrupting their sleep to the point that they aren't, um, you know, aren't able to function the following day, then it's a risk balance. But we would always start it at the lowest dose possible. And um, 
you know, doesn't tend to be a huge issue. Um, I, I know what you're asking, but um, because we do use smaller doses, we don't tend to see sort of worrisome side effects with it. Okay, can I carry on? Yes. Um, so, and as I alluded to, um, we also have to treat the depression. And as many of you may know, um, depression in uh, somebody with Parkinson's or in or in anyone as they get older can actually mimic a dementia. So often when we see someone and we're trying to sort out what's going on, we'll actually treat their mood first to see how they're kind of Cognition in, improves, and a number of different uh, drugs have been used. Although those three have been studied in um, in Parkinson's, um, and the ones with the stars have been studied in Lewy body. Obviously, other issues: constipation. Constipation uh, affects how medication is is um, is absorbed, and then urinary symptoms for uh, People who are having urinary urgency and frequency, again, more common in Lewy body than in Parkinson's related cognitive issues. Marabegron is a newer um, medication and it's felt to have fewer cognitive side effects. So it's kind of a go-to treatment for anyone with um, Parkinson's or Lewy body. And again, and you know, we're in the right place to kind of talk about this. The medication is a part of the treatment, but it's not the whole treatment. So we know that there is a whole team that has to be involved in treating people, um, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, um, recreational therapists, um, uh, support groups um, as, as you are a, a part of um, for the caregiver, for the, uh, for the person that, that has the disease, um, having social activities, um, looking at, at things to keep people cognitively in, engaged. So, um, you know, if you said, I, my prejudice of Courses. I was a physiotherapist, so I was part of the rehab team, and I, and I do feel very strongly, and I see this all the time with my patients. That if you said to me, "What's the percentage of how much this works versus how much that works?" I, you know, I kind of say to people, it's kind of half and half. The medication's only half of it. The other half of it is having people engaged in exercise and in cognitive activities, making sure speech and swallowing is good, having good education for people, having support for people, having a healthy diet. So it's not one, it's not one thing. I see a, a question has popped up. Yes, yeah, so this question is, are there side effects with the drugs for the urinary symptoms? Yeah. Good question. So um, the main side effect with the urinary medication is it can worsen hallucinations, although Marabegron, Merbetric is much, much, much less likely to do that. And it's why it's our, it's our go-to. Um, one of the issues though right now is the way it's funded through the government. You have to be tried on something else first. Um, but um, the all of the other urinary symptom treatments can uh, potentially worsen um, uh, confusion, although Merbetric is less likely. And there are other treatments too, certain things like Botox has been done as, as well and doesn't have any effects on their cognitive function. Somebody else has a question? Sorry, about to unmute myself. Um, this question relates to um, a diagnosis. Uh, the person had an original diagnosis of cortical basal degeneration. The right. person is realizing there's a lot of Lewy body dementia symptoms um, in terms of the actions, the issues, behaviors, and the symptoms that you've gone through. Mm -hmm. So the the person's trying to kind of understand cortical basal degeneration in association with these uh, the dementias that you're focusing on this evening. 
Yeah, so um, uh, so the um, yeah, I'm just trying to think how how to answer that. So cortical basal is has a particular criteria um, in which people have um, unilateral onset of symptoms as well as having um, cognitive issues. They also have a lot of dystonia, like abnormal posturing of the arm, difficulty using the hand. They have difficulty, a lot of difficulties with um, something called apraxia, which is motor planning. So can't figure out how to use a fork or a knife, um, can't dress them themselves, um, anything that involves sequencing, um, and, uh, and can go on to develop a strong language problem where they have like an aphasia, like they've had a, a stroke where they have word finding problems. Pieces of that can exist within Lewy body, but in cortical basal, it's the more prominent symptom. One of the difficulties is all of these diagnoses are based on a clinical assessment. And so we are not exact. In fact, there's studies about, in particular, cortical basal syndrome seems to be one of the harder ones to to diagnose clinically. And there's good reports that about a third of them probably have some other underlying cause, which may be Alzheimer's, may be Lewy body, may be a combination of the two of them. So it, it is something that I think we often struggle to diagnose and there may be crossover between the two of them. Someone else had their hand up? Um, this question, how do you access emotional support for either the caregiver or the patient? Um, if that attendee could reach out to their social worker at McCormick, um, we can explore that uh, in a little more personal fashion. Thank you. Thank you for being here to, to offer your support group education. See, that was good. That was good. Um, yeah, so we, I think that's, um, I'm glad you guys are, are here because this is obviously, um, as I said, probably half of the half of the treatment. And then uh, people wanted me to just touch on research, and there is a lot of research going on about this because, as you know, it's a very very difficult disease to live with. Um, it is a disease that progresses quite rapidly. It has a huge impact on the person living with it. It has a huge impact on families and, and caregivers. And so as much as all of the treatments that I've talked about are symptomatic treatments, none of these are our cures, right? So we are searching for something to cure the disease to stop the symptoms from getting worse. And uh, so I, I, um, I did a review of what's out there and I thought I would just highlight some of the treatments. So first of all, um, we're trying to get better at diagnosing it and trying to identify it before it's actually reached a clinical stage. The reason is, is because at the other end of the spectrum is we're trying to come up with cures and treatment, if we can identify it very early or identify it even before people have symptoms, then maybe we can start a treatment that can alter the, the disease course. Um, there's a lot of work. I, a number of you probably know Dr. Elizabeth Finger, who does a lot of lean body work and and she is um, she is one of the researchers who's doing neuroimaging, so um, advanced MRI, um, uh, PET scans, trying to come up with a better diagnosis. So is the one person alluded to, how do I decide if it's cortical basal or it's, or it's Lewy body, and we're just going by symptoms, and you know sometimes we're not sure ourselves, right? We, think it's this and then it turns out to be something else. So trying to come up with a better imaging diagnosis and then looking at as they did with the nun study at neuropathology, how can we use that then to, to guide us in? Well, those were the symptoms. 
this is a definitive diagnosis from the pathological changes that helps us I, I identify other people who may have the disease. So early diagnosis is a is a is a um, is a very important thing and try to improve diagnostic accuracy. There's other available medications that are being treated. Currently, memantine is a drug that it's still not clear if it, if it helps Lewy body, but is being explored. And then other medications like the Aricept or the Dinepazil um, uh, or the, the, or the Stigmine. So other drugs of that class are, are being studied. So those are you know studies that are probably coming down the pipeline soon. Looking at rehabilitation treatment, um, you know, do people do better with physio and occupational therapy and neuropsychology? And, you know, we think they do, but what treatment is the most important? And then disease modifying studies. So we know from Parkinson's um, and from some of the dementia research that exercise um, and brain training may actually slow the disease down. And so people are, are studying more about that. I'm just going to pause because I see three questions mm -hmm. now. So. Yeah, this first question is an important question. Um, okay. The person asks, can you touch on end stage Lewy body disease? At what point do you consider placement for the person, I assume, in long term care? This is not talked about enough and can be a very difficult stage for caregivers, of course. I'll just put um, this plant this seed. We are hosting a, a live webinar on February, February 15th, which may help address some of these issues in terms of end stage and end of life care and that whole transition and managing the emotions. But now I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Um, yeah, that's as, as, as uh, you alluded to Catherine, it's a, it's a whole, it's a, it's a whole evening and beyond. Um, it, um, it is, there's no one answer for, to that, right? So there's no, okay, you've reached the stage. This is the point where, where people can't stay at uh, at home. And it's not the same disease in any two people. So there are people that have a Lewy body who, you know, hallucinate and see things, but are otherwise functioning fairly well. Their caregiver um, is coping, they have enough supports to stay home, then, you know, I, I think as, as long as all of that is in place, then it's reasonable. But then there are people who are, you know, wandering outside the house, who are becoming agitated or violent, um, who are very difficult for the caregiver to deal with, for the family to deal with, for even people coming in the home to deal with. And, you know, that is a stage where for the safety of everyone, we start to talk about, is this the right place for the person to be? So it's not an easy answer and it is really a case by case. And what are your supports? What is your own health like? What is the person's disease like? And um, yeah, it's not the same for any two people. Yeah. Yeah, so it is quite individual. I, I I think something that I do think is important, though, is to reach out for help early and to start those conversations early and to start talking about what can we do, who can help me, who are my resources, and, and certainly, you know, things like the McCormick um, Home Day Program has been a, a, a you know, savior for so many people, right? Because many people say, well, I can cope if I have five hours in the day that I'm not having to care for my loved one. Um, but I, it, it's, it's not an easy answer. And, um, and it is a lot to do with the disease and how that person is presenting and a lot to, to do with how much, how much help you yourself have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's lots of layers to that one. Yes. Next question is, when would memantine, memantine be added to donepazil? 
Yeah, so it's still, a, the memantine is still um, uh, not proven to necessarily be effective. So sometimes, um, you know, people in particular who are cognitive specialists like Dr. Finger or Dr. Pasternak might talk about adding it in. The research is pretty equivocal still. So we're still trying to figure out who are the people that would benefit and we don't know the answer. So it's not a standard of care right now to add that. It's it's more in the realm of, of um uh, an experimental approach or, a, you know, trying to understand how it works. The approach. Okay, next question. Can symptoms, including cognitive issues, occur for several years, for example, in early onset Parkinson before the age of 60 and progress more quickly or slowly over time? So I, I I think this person is asking, can you see the cognitive issues kind of well in advance before the other symptoms? Um, before the motor symptoms? Like, yeah, yeah, you, you can. So 75% of people that have a dementia with Lewy bodies have Parkinsonism, but 25% of them don't. And um, so some of them may never develop motor symptoms. They may only have a cognitive issue. The other thing is that some of them may have the cognitive issue for a number of years before we see the Parkinson's come into play. Yes, both of those instances. Next question, what do you recommend therapeutically for apathy in a Lewy body, in a person with Lewy body? Yeah, that is the hard one. And I didn't really, it, it, it's always hard to know how much to get into things. Apathy is a very difficult thing because it has such a huge impact on the caregivers and the families and the friends that, um, you know, the person is just not engaged. They're not, uh, they're not participating, they seem to be withdrawn. People often wonder if they're depressed and we do explore that. Um, there is um, one study that has looked at revestigmine, exelon in, um, in apathy in Parkinson's, but only one study, we, we often will try it. I have not found that it's terribly effective. We do also explore mood issues to see if there is a concurrent depression. Um, I think talking about it is, is important, but it is, it's, it's something that I, we still don't have the right treatment for. This next question um, is coming from a practitioner. Seeking your opinion about people being started on levocarb by a GP when idiopathic Parkinson's disease is suspected while they're waiting to see a specialist. This person has noted that um, in their practice, there are people who are waiting to see a neurologist to confirm Parkinson's, but the person is really suffering while they're waiting and they're often at high risk for falls. Sure, sure. Yeah. So, um, so uh, levodopa is, um, is a very good drug for Parkinson's obviously helps motor symptoms. I think it's reasonable. We, we start treatment at the point where someone needs treatment. You are not doing harm in starting them on treatment. Um, you do want to monitor obviously for any, any side effects in particular, cognitive side effects or things like hallucinating. The, the issue is, is, if they do have cognitive issues, they may start to hallucinate on the medication, but warn people about that. And if that becomes an issue, then you can always wean it off. The only thing I would say is be cautious not to over treat them. So we start treatment and we want to increase it slowly because this is a long disease and we don't want to give them side effects from the medication too early. But I mean, I totally agree with starting treatment at a, at a point as they're waiting to see someone. I will also just put a plug in the fact that we've just hired two more movement disorder specialists to our program, which we are thrilled about. And so I'm hoping the wait list will start to come down a bit. That's great news. Uh, this next question is related to that question. Um, this practitioner also states that there are people 
who are whole, who are sort of delaying beginning their medication because they think it'll help them more later down the road. Is that a myth? Is that possibly true? That sort of thing. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, so the there's actually been a ton of research done on this because there were drugs that were brought up for Parkinson's that people thought were neuroprotective, like rusagiline and smegiline. And then there's medication like levodopa that at one point people thought was harmful. So they've done studies that they've taken two groups of people not treated someone for six months and the other group started them early and then followed them over the time. For both groups, there is no harm of starting the medication early. Um, the only harm for anyone obviously is that um, you are potentially exposing them to side effects which could start to come in at kind of five to 10 years. But the bottom line is we treat people at the point that they need it functionally. So holding off on treatment isn't the answer. When they need it functionally, we need to treat them. Something I always tell my patients is that we know exercise, particularly in Parkinson's, but also probably in, in um, Lewy body is actually neuroprotective. It keeps the brain cells living longer. So if you can't exercise because you're too slow and stiff, that's a time when we should be starting on, on treatment. But I would not hold off on treatment. I would start it at the time people need it. I'm just wondering, do you want to do another section of your presentation? Sure. And I'm, and I'm actually, that? yeah, and I'm actually coming to the end. I think I have just kind of two more slides. So right. I, I wanted to talk about, there's a whole sort of drug pipeline of all these new disease modifying drugs that are out there. These are not approved. These are all still research. Some of them are drugs that are approved for other diseases, but have not been proven to be helpful in, in uh, Lewy body, but I just wanted to talk about them because these are only just a sample. There was, you know, uh, probably 20 of them, but I wanted to just give you a flavor of the fact that there is a lot of research going on about this. The first drug I practice saying, and I don't think I have it, but I think it's Neflamop. No, nope, I'm not even going to try it. Um, this is a, a new drug and, and is applying for FDA approval for Lee body in the States. They It affects stress proteins. So they think that stress proteins cause some of the abnormal Lee bodies uh, to develop and have noted improvement in walking and also in cognitive function. So still, as I said, at the experimental stage, but quite hopeful. Um, and, and Broxel and a number of you may have been involved in the Broxel study that was led by um, Dr. Pasternak here. Um, and it, um, it increases an, an enzyme glucose ribosidase, which reduces the alpha synuclein. So you probably remember the Lewy body, the abnormal protein in that Lewy body, the abnormal thing in the brain cells is the alpha synuclein. Um, still, the um, study is wrapped up in, in terms of participants, but they're looking at the data for that. So we're excited to hear the, the outcome of it. Um, there's a group of drugs called um, tyrosine kinase inhibitors that are used for leukemia. And these actually remove that abnormal protein, the alpha nucleon from the brain. And so um, there's more than one drug. There were about four drugs being studied of that class to see if it can improve, um, improve the body through removing the abnormal protein. Um, uh, tericin, which is used for prostate uh, disease, oh, something just decided to pop up on my screen, um, uh, has uh, been found to perhaps a slow neuron loss and increase dopamine levels. And so it's being studied in Lewy body. Um, 
Uh, clinbuterol um, is also being studied with the idea that it may increase blood flow to keep cells living longer. Um, and then this last one, which I also will not even try to say, um, works on growth factors. So activating growth factors to help cells live longer and to regenerate. And I, you know, I really just wanted to bring up that it, um, there is a lot of research going on. Um, I, I think there is a big interest through, you know, through a lot of different um, agencies and, and uh, a lot of hope with that, a lot of hope to to find medication which can either modify the disease or or slow it down or even possibly cures. Um, just a quick take home. So we talked about the dementia with Lewy bodies has the features of visual hallucinations fluctuation, so good and bad days, and Parkinsonism. There are some similarities between the dementia with Lewy bodies and Parkinson's, although the time sequence is, is very different, and some of the clinical features are as well. Cholinesterase inhibitors, the drugs like Aricept and Exelon are very effective to help symptoms, and very important to have a multidiscipline approach to manage um, the disease. And I'm ready for more questions. Okay. Um, there is a request to return to the question about frequent falls and how a caregiver can. Oh, so let, let's you. address that one first. <laughs> Yeah, so um, so falls in in um, Lewy body and in Parkinsonism can be due to a number of factors. Um, so they can be related to uh, blood pressure drops when people stand up. They can be associated with um, a pure balance issue, and they can be associated with a walking issue. Uh, they can be associated with cognitive issues. So somebody's not being terribly safe, they aren't using a walker or a cane if they if they have it. So the first thing is to explore what the potential cause is. Um, and if it's frequent, you know, we always want to make sure that it's not a blood pressure drop, which is an easier thing to deal with. Um, usually, I would start with uh, trying to figure out what the cause is. And then I would involve a physiotherapist and occupational therapist evaluating the person in the home to see you know why are these falls occurring are there safety equipment we can put in the home is there education for the um for the patient and the and the caregiver um so yeah so first of all figuring out the problem and then um bringing in our we have um colleagues to help us with that this next question, it kind of relates to that, so I'll ask it now. In advanced dementia with Lewy bodies and Parkinson's, if there are more issues with balance and falls, at what point would levo slash carbidopa be advised? Oh, yeah, that is such a good question. Um, it's not a good answer. It is a good question. So levodopa, carbidopa, it's called that because the carbidopa helps block some of the side effects of the Level dopa often we'll call it levocarb, so it's just a bit briefer. Helps um, improve the um, uh, speed with which you respond, so it loosens up the muscles, so it's easier to get up out of a chair, easier to walk, easier easier to get in and out of bed. Unfortunately, it in itself does not affect balance, so it it can help balance in the fact that you're able to react quicker to something, but we have no drug at this time that helps balance. So balance is a thing, again, that we really rely on our rehab colleagues to, to help us with that. Exercise can help balance, activities can help balance, and then aids, aids to um, help the person with that. Great. Next question. Can you speak to drowsiness? How much do you let the person sleep if they're having a drowsy day? Yeah. Um, so um, 
uh, drowsiness is very common. Fatigue is very common, especially as the disease progresses. As long as someone is sleeping at nighttime, and if they're still drowsy in the day, they probably need that sleep. And trying to keep them awake is probably not going to make things better overall for them. But if they aren't sleeping at night, then I think it is important to try and keep them awake as much as you can in the day so they are able to sleep at um, night. So I think that's probably the bigger issue is not so much the drowsiness in the day, but the sleep at night and that they aren't getting turned around in the days and nights. Next question also really relates to levodopa. Uh, this person says, if levodopa seems to have no effect, could the person just have Lewy body disease, even though they have a one-sided tremor? Yes. Um, bottom line, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, the bottom line is yes to that. So although we think... Uh, Dementia with Lewy bodies more commonly presents with bilateral symptoms. It can still be on one side. Um, the Lewy body, the levodopa still usually is helpful, but um, probably not as helpful as with idiopathic Parkinson's. And, and one of the issues is we're somewhat limited in increasing it because of potential side effects in Lewy body. Great uh, question. Um, this person has Parkinson's disease and doesn't sleep well at night. Um, develop, this person developed cellulitis in their left arm and wondered, is this part of Parkinson's? Parkinson's? Um, and they're now they're sleeping even less. So my heart goes out to this person. I know. Yeah. Sleep, sleep. I did a whole talk on, on sleep. Um, sleep problems are very, very common in both Parkinson's and blue body. Um, and so, you know, I, and, and um, it's a longer answer, but certainly again, trying to figure out why you're having difficulty sleeping is the biggest thing to start with because it can be part of the Parkinson's, it can be mood issues. And now with you, it's the it's the pain with the cellulitis. Um, so I think having a conversation with your doctor about why you're having these issues. Is it your bladder? Is it your Parkinson's? Is it is it something else going on? And then targeting to treat the 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 cause. The cellulitis is not part of Parkinson's though, so it's a completely separate disease. I'm sorry to hear that. Mm -hmm. Next question. At what stage of Lewy body dementia journey do you leave the family doctor and move to a specialist such as yourself? Yeah, um, that's, that's a, that's a, if, if only we we had all the resources in the world, you know these are this is a very difficult disease. I mean, certainly no one ever leaves their family doctor, and so we always need them involved as part of the care team. But I think this is a difficult disease um, in a specialist hands to deal with. So I can't imagine as a family doctor who's dealing with a million other things. I I um, I think it's a challenge. So I. Think seeking seeking a specialist care is important. Uh, here's a question: Is there evidence that memory drugs and the person uses memory in quotes improve or slow progression slash side effects? So I I would like to know what they mean by memory drugs, but I'll let you answer that. Yeah, I mean if you if you mean like the ones that are currently in approved like Aricept and Exelon, there's no evidence they, oh, or I, maybe they're meaning over the counter memory drugs because there's things out there that say that they slow it. Um, at the current writing, we do not have a drug that's available, that's approved, that's out there that slows the progression of the disease. So there isn't there isn't a, a drug either either over the counter or a prescription. Um, exercise, though, on the other hand, has has actually been shown to slow the progression of the disease. So it's not a drug, but it's a good thing to to help. 
Next question. How does the autonomic system affect blood pressure even though the person's being medicated? Um, I'm not sure I totally understand that, but I'll, I'll address that. So blood pressure is part of the autonomic system. And um, in people who have Lewy body, they have more of a tendency to have involvement of the autonomic nervous system that their blood pressure control isn't as good. Um, and so from the disease, their blood pressure control isn't as good. Unfortunately, levodopa can also worsen drops in, in blood pressure. So it becomes one of the side effects that can limit how we use that drug if someone's having a lot of difficulties with blood pressure. There are other medications though that can be used and a lot of um, uh, non-medication treatments like support stockings, abdominal binders, getting up slowly, having enough liquid, adding salt to your diet. So there's a number of things we can do for that part of the autonomic system, but the Parkinson's medication unfortunately works against as opposed to for that. Uh, next question, should doses of drugs be increased as dementia progresses? Does it help to increase the medication? Uh, the the like the Aricepin, the Exelon, I assume they mean. So for both of those drugs, um, our uh, the current research will advise us to you know start at a base level and then increase over over time to the maximum dose. We don't really think that increasing beyond that helps more, and then people tend to get into more side effects. Again, I think that's something that's being looked at that, you know, are there higher doses that may be helpful, but for now, we don't seem to think that going above and beyond is more helpful than the, than the um, increase that you started at. You know, the one that you increase to and then stop, which is what we'll do in the first few months. We don't think increasing beyond that is more helpful. Okay, and the last question for now, is there any evidence for any nutritional, nutrition-based treatments? So I'm not sure if this person is referring to foods or supplements, but yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, certainly we know healthy diet is, is important and we want to make sure that everyone's getting all of the nutrition that they need. Um, there's no one um, uh, food, a food or supplement that is, um, that is more effective for Lewy body or for Parkinson's. There are, there is a lot of things out there that may tell you that, you know, this is a cure for that. I, I wish that were true. And I wish we, I wish we had, you know, that cure, but I think just a healthy diet is, is important. Question. Oh, another question about diet. Okay. Uh, what are some of the best foods is more protein better? How do sugars affect, um, these different um, disorders? Yeah, so um, uh, more protein is not is not better. I mean, you need enough protein. As, as anyone may know who's on Parkinson's medication, the protein can interfere with the uptake of levodopa, and so we'll often try and dose it a bit away from... Um, taking protein, especially as the disease progresses, but overall more or less protein is not helpful or, or harmful. It's, um, you know, just good to do that. I'm sorry, I forgot, but the second part of the question is because I had a good answer for it. Uh, sugar? Sugar, yes. So, um, you know, lots of sugar is probably not good for any of us, but it isn't particularly bad for Parkinson's, but in someone who has diabetes as well as Parkinson's, then we're dealing with two diseases. So I think, you know, not getting into other, other um, health risks is important. We also know that 
you know, in the way that sugar can lead to diabetes, can, do, can lead to people having small strokes, that strokes on top of Lewy body can, can complicate the disease. Okay, uh, this question, what is the maximum, maximum dosage of levodopa? I love it. Um, there is no maximum. Um, it's all to do with side effect profile. It, it's a very unusual drug because people don't absorb it the same or process it the same. We don't really know which it is. So I follow people that have had Parkinson's for 25 years and are still only on a tablet three times a day. Because if I go higher, then they develop side effects. And then I have people who are on 15 or 20 tablets a day and have not had any side effects, probably because they don't absorb it as well. So there isn't really a set maximum. It's all to do with how your body responds to it. Uh, next question, what drugs are often used when a person exhibits aggressive or violent behavior? Yeah, so um, so in um, someone that ha that is on Parkinson's medication and developing violent behavior will often reduce the Parkinson's medication because it actually may be making that worse. So the first thing we would do is try to cut back on that. Sometimes the, the memory pills, the cholinesterase inhibitors can be helpful. Um, medications um, such as uh, quetiapine or clozapine sometimes can be helpful. Trazodone, which is also used for sleep, sometimes can be helpful. So there are a number of different medications we can um, trial, um, but often removing the, the offending medication is more helpful than anything else we can add in. Next question, is plant protein better than animal protein for Parkinson's medication absorption? Um, no, no, it's protein is protein and, and so it doesn't seem to matter what kind it is. And the last question at this point, should you force a person living with dementia to eat if they refuse to eat? Yeah, um, so that's not an easy answer. And I'm glad Catherine is here with me to help me with this. Um, you know, as people, um, as people progress with a disease, any disease, so whether it's dementia, whether it's something like um, cancer, they tend to withdraw from food as the disease progresses. And part of it is the fact that they, their body doesn't seem to process the food as well. So if they if they are eating if they're eating too much, it actually isn't doing what it's supposed to. The food isn't doing what it's supposed to. And it's a natural progression that people will tend to withdraw from food. Having said that, we would always want to explore, is there something else at play here? Is there a depression? Is there some other medical illness? So if people are stopping eating, we would want to explore all of that first and make sure that there isn't something else going on leading to that. I think encouraging people to eat is okay, but if they're choosing not to, that is a, a normal uh, progression of the disease that they do tend to withdraw from the food. And that's all the questions we have at this point. Okay, boy, you guys asked hard questions. That was impressive. We have one attendee who has raised their hand okay. and um, I can press the button and, and allow this sure. person to talk. Um, if they're comfortable doing so, just please don't use your name because we are recording this. We want to maintain your privacy. So I'm just going to click on that person and invite uh, this attendee to, to talk. You'll have to unmute yourself. And well, if anyone else has any questions, just type them into the Q&A and we'll keep going.
Okay. Okay, I don't see any more questions coming up right now. And thank you everyone for all of the questions. That was a great, great discussion and, uh, and great questions that, that you guys had. Um, so I'd like to thank Dr. Jenkins so much for this presentation and for um, all of your answers to all, all of the questions that got thrown at you. It's not always easy when you're, you're put on the spot and you don't know what you're gonna get asked. Um, so, so that was great. And um, thank you so much for, for coming and presenting for us. And um, hopefully you'll, you'll come back in the future. Yeah, and thank you very much for inviting me. And thank you to everyone for, to ask all, all of those questions. It's, um, you know, it's, it's important because it, 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 you know, it's good, obviously, for everyone to hear them, but it also guides me through future presentations when I hear the kind of questions people ask. I I think, well, you know, those are things that I probably need to in, include as uh, as well. And I I appreciate everyone's uh, everyone. These were excellent questions and made me think about. Oh, I should have put that in the in the presentation. So thank you very much. I think there's one last question. I don't know if you wanted to address that one Catherine. well people are saying thank you um okay. there's uh much gratitude being shown here um the, one person has asked about um more resources so i will mention that we had a few attendees from the guelph wellington area there is a support group in that region and it sounds like they're pretty well um taken care of um, and McCormick Dementia Services uh, offers a number of different support groups and caregiver education programs um, and a, a specialized support group for people who are caring for a person living with Lewy bodies, Lewy body dementia or Parkinson's. Um, oh, and one more question. Um, this person asks about um, the progression of uh, their loved one's face starting to slant over to one side and the person's grimacing and closing that eye. Um, and this is becoming more pronounced as the disease progresses. Hmm. Is that something they should get checked out? Yeah, I think um, that could be a few different things. It could be side effects of medication, but it could be others. So I would get that checked out. I'm not 100% sure what that is. So yeah, I would agree with that. And just a couple more thank yous. All right. Well, thank you all very much. And I and I hope that was useful um, and i um, happy to come back. And thank you to you guys for all the work you do. It is greatly appreciated. Wonderful. Great. Well, thank you. And I hope everyone has a good evening. Good night. Take care.